Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to introduce you tonight to Leslie Timbold. Uh, Leslie is a registered psychotherapist in Ontario, Canada. She's been in private practice for over 20 years. She's also a certified mental game coaching professional for athletes, and her extensive hobby is that of a competitive women's physique bodybuilder. Wow. So you're a mental game coaching professional and a women's physique bodybuilder. How did you get into that? (laughs) <laughs> well, if you asked me, Brian, 10 years ago, if I would ever be a bodybuilder, period, uh, I would have asked what you were smoking because that was so far off my radar. I worked out for, for, for decades, but it was whether it was from a VCR tape to some very intro stuff in the gym. Eventually in the gym, I got, uh, I guess I, w- I got to a point where I got good enough where some of the gym members would approach me and say, what are you training for? And I would ask them, well, what do you mean? What am I training for? I'm just here to train. I'm just here to train. But they thought I was an athlete and, and that surprised me. So I knew there were people in my gym that actually did bodybuild. And some of them actually came up to me and suggested I try it. Just give it a try. At the time, I was in my mid 40s and I was thinking, well, it's kind of late for me to start bodybuilding, you know, because I focused on the family and developing my career as a a registered psychotherapist. But I thought it's a bucket list. So why not just, you know, work on just give it a shot, say I've done it and then be done with it. So I had to try to find a trainer because I had no idea what I was doing. And there were some uh, trainers at my gym. So I asked some people around and they suggested this one individual. So I, 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 hired, um, I hired him. So what he suggested is because I've never competed, I never saw a show, that I should do a practice show and then the real show. So the practice show was about three weeks before. And what happened is that I was expecting nothing. Like I trained, I followed the diet. Um, I got second place. So Reverse the nice thing about, yeah. <laughs> so then it got in my head, oh, maybe I've got something here. So when I did the real show, I was really excited. And again, I placed second place. And I'm like, you know, when you're so close to something, so close to that first, and I'm like, I got to do another show. <laughs> so Brian, that became the beginning of me getting what we call the competition bug. So what that means is that it's hard to get out of our systems and we just keep competing. Um, Now, what I did notice, though, in competing with, you know, whether it be people in the gym or people backstage at the shows, is that they were being affected mentally by this preparation. So it's not an easy thing. I mean, the training is hard, don't get me wrong, and the eating is not a picnic, (laughs) for sure. But there was another component in there that was interfering with a lot of people's ability to perform as well as they could. So I, I kind of wanted to look into that. Now, I already have the, the psychology background, but I was really amazed at the lack of knowledge and let's say um, coaches out there that offer that mental component. A lot of the coaches will help you with your training, with your dieting, with your posing, but there was no coaches out there that I came across that's strictly focused on the mental health piece. And let me break down that mental health piece. There's two pieces to it. One is, let's say competitors getting ready for a show and they're having relationship issues or someone close to them had had died. It's really hard to get back into the mindset because your mind is gonna be distracted by those personal issues, which which are common, life happens. So that's one piece. The other piece is, let's say, uh, just competing. It's not easy. You're getting judged on your body. Anxiety can happen. Um, You look at people on social media that are competing as well, and you're like, I can't look like that, or I don't look like that, or why do I have any business competing? Because I can't compare to that person. So we get in our heads. And that's what really drew me into that piece to say, okay, where are the coaches out there that help bodybuilders? And it's not just bodybuilders, it's any athletes. So I really wanted to look into that mental health component on the performance, the athletic performance side. So I decided, you know, I'm going to take a course in this. You know, not only would it help myself, but I want to help other, uh, I want to start with bodybuilders, but I want to do athletes. But ironically, Brian, a lot of the strategies I learned can help 
not just with athletes. It can help with business personnel. It can help with people, let's say, in the fashion, in the entertainment industry. It can help with the normal person. We all can get in our heads. And it's learning how to say, how can we get out of our heads? So, you know, that's kind of what got me into the competitive bodybuilding and then eventually the the mental game piece. What a fascinating experience. And, and tell me, you started out as a, as a registered psychotherapist, correct? Mm-hmm. And so how did you go from a registered psychotherapist? You were just working out in the gym a lot. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's how I started. I, I was working out in the gym and the idea of competing never entered my mind because I was never, I always had an issue with food. So, you know, I thought, you know, in order to be a bodybuilder, you have to have your, you know, your stuff together as far as being disciplined. And I could work out. Working out was never my issue. It was the eating piece. Eating healthy all the time was extremely challenging for me. And that's to keep your weight down or your muscle tone up or both? Both. You go through phases where you need to, like right now, I'm in what's called a bulk phase, but it's a clean bulk. So what do I mean by that? A clean bulk is where you put on size to put on lean muscle mass, but you don't want to put on too much fat. So there's something called macronutrients, and that has to do with proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And it's about manipulating those ratios. Now, I have a coach to help me that knows my body type now to say what works and what doesn't. So it's a a bit of trial and error. And like I said, it's good to get a coach if you are going to do any kind of bodybuilding to give you that guidance. How long have you been doing this? So I started competing at the age of 45. So um, I'm, so I've done since 2014 and I'm 53 right now and I'll be turning 54 in June. So, <laughs> so 54 minus 45. So 10 years. Yeah, about 10 years, yeah. Has it changed your life? So much so. I'm a different person than I was 10 years ago. How? So 10 years ago, I had an unhealthy relationship with food. So when it came to, let's say, if you had a stressful day, I would eat more. And I don't mean necessarily the healthy stuff. (laughs) It could be chips. It could be cookies. You know, that's the yummy stuff, the unhealthy stuff. So obviously I put on weight and what I would do is to say, okay, if I, if I ate a little bit more that day, then I would do, let's say more cardio, you know, as far as like, you know, I have a treadmill, so I'll just do more treadmill workouts or longer workouts. And that's not the kind of relationship you want. I'm not against doing cardio. In fact, I, you know, it's great for fitness levels, but not as the reason to, because you overate. So I have a much healthier relationship with food because the competition diet actually retrains your brain in category in in putting in looking at food a different way so this is a huge thing food we're we're taught that certain foods are good and certain foods are bad here's the thing what i've learned is that you can have too much of a good food so when i say good i mean healthy yeah so let's say broccoli broccoli is normally a health considered a healthy food i love broccoli broccoli is great but it can, it can really mess up your digestive system if you have too much of it. Now, you can have it every day. Again, it has to do with quantities. And if you like, you know, your sweets or your chips or whatever that I call it your vice food is, it doesn't mean you can't put it in. It's just that you have to learn how to put it in and when to put it in. So it's about timing. It's about strategic eating. And I never learned that before I started. Strategic cooking. eating. Yes. Strategic eating. We're chatting tonight with Leslie Timball. Uh, She is a registered psychotherapist in Ontario. She's also in private practice uh, for 20 years in that regard. And she's a certified mental game coaching professional for athletes. And her hobby, her expensive and extensive hobby, is that of competitive women's physique bodybuilding. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in two minutes with Leslie. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm chatting tonight with Leslie Timball. She is a registered psychotherapist uh, here in Ontario. She's been in private practice for over 20 years. She's also a certified mental game coaching professional for athletes. And her hobby is that of being a competitive women's physique bodybuilder. Um, You know, this is absolutely fascinating. It's interesting that you say that the competition has helped you with um, 
having a more healthy relationship with, uh, with food. How else mm -hmm. has uh, competing either benefited you or impacted you? I've learned also um, better training techniques. I didn't realize how bad my, my workout form was until I actually worked with a coach. So the nice thing about uh, this piece is that in my experience, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've learned from them. And now I get to share that with other people as well as the nice thing is uh, um, what came out of it is that when I compete, I compete for myself to push myself uh, physically and mentally. What I did not expect was that I would be able to, you know, get to my physique to a, a level I never would have otherwise. There's no way. So, I mean, there's like, my legs are really taking me a really long time to get in. So, you know, for me to get a bigger quad, it's this, we're talking about decades of training <laughs> because I'm not genetically blessed. Right. And also when you're older, so I started at 45, I'm 53 right now. So when you're older, the thing is, is that it's harder to do, but it's not impossible. So what I want to do is inspire people to say, hey, if you never started bodybuilding and you like working out, it's not too late. You have to manage your expectations as far as what you can achieve. But the thing is, is about continuing on being resilient, having some strategies as well as support systems, which brings me to the other point of one of the benefits is backstage. You make a lot of friendships. Really? When I compete against other other girls, you know, initially, yes, they're your competitor. But then after what we call it, the show is usually divided into two pieces. There's what we call um, basically the uh, the pre-show and then, you know, the actual show. So in, in that piece um, before the show, everyone's kind of quiet into themselves. As soon as that's done, we're chatting. And the biggest thing we chat about backstage, if anyone wants to know, is food. What are we going to eat after the show? Girls are bringing out cookies and muffins and pizzas and baked everything. And we're just like, <laughs> and we become friends and we chat and we share each other's journeys, our struggles. And having that social support is wonderful. What was really cool, just to piggyback on what I was saying about the, um, the inspiration, though, is I didn't realize that people were watching my journey. Like there were people that I have com competed against that came to me and said, I competed because I saw you. You know, I was in the audience and then I competed against you. And I had this girl and she said, I am standing on stage with you and I am so honored to be on the stage with you. And here I am just, I, I don't think anything of myself. I'm just this amateur. She's like, you inspired me to get to this journey and to be on stage with you. And for that, I thank you. And there was no payment in the world that could have compared to that. Now, so, I understand that, um, you know, some of these uh, bodybuilders use uh, steroids and things like that. Is that a challenge? It's a challenge. Now, the thing is, is that when you want to compete at the pro level, I don't know any pro any pros that don't do um, some type of what we call PED. So these are uh, personal. Uh, what's the um what is it? Uh, something enhancing drugs. Anyway, so that's the steroid piece. Unless you're extremely genetically gifted, you're only going to get so far in your journey. So for me, I was against steroids vehemently, vehemently, because I wanted to push my body as far as I could naturally. And I did. Then I came to a plateau in 20 so i i competed from 2014 i did five shows it was supposed to be two i ended up doing five shows in 2014 i did two in 2015 two in 2016 2017 um i did two 2018 i did one 2019 i wanted to take some time off and and start to work towards the amateur um Arnold's that is the first show that I've trained for that I turned over to what we call the dark side I had maxed out my genetics as far as what I could accomplish and I wanted to see how far could I push it but I wasn't going to do high doses I was going to do the absolute lowest doses and I did the research on it I knew what the side effects were I wanted to and I knew I was going to do this for a long period of time oh sorry personal enhancing drugs that's it so it's about saying okay, how can I do this as healthy as possible, even if I use PEDs? Mm -hmm. 
you got to do your research, have a good coach. You have to be able to do your blood work to make sure all your markers are in place and that you're not damaging yourself. And I've been very respectful of that. And if I have to pull back, I pull back. And but what, yeah, what, the thing what, is, what, what are the side effects? Well, one of the side effects, depending on what you're using, is a deeper voice. So you can probably hear that my voice is a little deeper than, let's say, a traditional females, and that's part of it. Other pieces could be um, females will get like a square, more square jaw, like like a guy's. They can have more masculine features, so that their face will can change a little bit over time. And I don't mean your 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 face is sunken in, because that that's what happens when you're on a diet. Like when I'm on when I'm close to show, you know it because I look like Skeletor. Like my, <laughs> I look gray and my, my cheeks are gone in, but that's the diet. And it fills back up when I have carbs again. But, you know, when you have PEDs, they will cause certain physical um, ramifications that are permanent. Like the voice change, that's forever. You can't get that back. So that's something you have to be willing to say, hey, is this worth that kind of p- price? Now, for me, because I was doing the absolute lowest and I continue just to do the absolute lowest when I'm in a prep, I'm on absolutely nothing now. It's important to go completely off. Not everyone does. They do something called cruising, which they use a little bit, but it's really important to go off because it's important for your receptors to be fresh and it's also healthier for your body. And so is it worth it? Has it been worth it? For me, yes. Why? Because I can push my body in a way that normally I physically can't and I can get the results I normally can't. And then hopefully my goal is I'm gonna do two shows this year. So my practice show is gonna be October 1st in Burlington. That's called the Legends Cup. And that'll be my warm up show to get me ready for the Amateur Olympia on December 13th. For me to be competitive at the Olympia level, Unfortunately, for someone with my poor genetics, if you have great genetics, you probably could get away with it in the amateur level. Right. About not doing PEDs. For me, because I don't have good genetics at all, I do need to do the PEDs. Okay. And yeah. um, what do you advise people when they come to you for coaching? So we look at what their goals are and what, as far as, you know, where they've been, how many shows have they done? Like I'm talking strictly bodybuilding. But, you know, I've worked, you know, if there's, I've worked with soccer players and baseball players. So, I mean, it depends on what your sport is, but I'll just focus on bodybuilding for now. I'll find out their history as far as the number of coaches they worked with before. And it may not be mental game coaches because I want to know if they've been with like reputable coaches or not. Because there's a lot of coaches out there that are not, are not healthy. They don't care about their athlete. They'll help their athlete win at any cost, including their that athlete's health and that's not good. So it's about, you know, finding out what their goals are, what, as far as, you know, do you want to get on a particular stage or do you want to stay in your category? What are some things that are going on in your personal life that might be interfering when you've competed before? What are some of the struggles that you've had? And I put a game plan together about all of the obstacles that have prevented that particular athlete from reaching the status that they want and, and give them concrete things that they can do in their training. Not just the week before the show or the day of the show. This is something you have to practice. This, these are skills. Because if if it was innate, if it was something that they don't need to learn, they wouldn't be seeing me. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so how do you provide, how did you get this certificate to work with athletes? So I did some research because I wanted to find a good uh, place to get my certification. So there was a place in Florida And it was uh, peak performance sports. Now, at the time they did it, um, and they uh, do it online because I'm in Canada and uh, I'm a Canadian resident. So for me to be able to get that kind of coaching and a lot of the good sports coaching is in the U.S. So I wanted to be able to get that education. And when I researched the various uh, institutions, peak performance sports is based on the mental game coaches that Olympic athletes use. When you're talking about the Olympics, you're talking about the best of the best in any sport. So you collect the, the greatest minds and mental game coaches for the Olympic athletes, and you put that in a training course, and that's what I took. Fantastic. And so yeah. how much time do you spend doing sort of your typical um, psychotherapy? Uh, you're a psychotherapist, a registered psychotherapist versus this specialty with uh, athletes now. So the athletes, even though I got my certificate, uh, my certificate a few years ago, 
because of my competing, when you're, when I compete, I'm in a very laser focused mindset. So I'm focusing on the show. So to build that business up, I had to put it on hold until my, my training came to a bit of a more manageable standpoint. I had to wait until I was off season. So I'm in off season now, and that's why I'm focusing on this now. So it's fairly new. I've been coaching some athletes, I would say over the past maybe four or five months. So it's fairly new, but because I'm now in a better place and I have the time when I'm in prep, I'm training three times a day. Plus I'm doing my, my counseling business. Plus I'm trying to get laundry and cooking. <laughs> so from a time perspective, as you know, when you open up any business, you have to be able to put the time You're training in. three times a day for how long? No, when I'm in prep, when I'm in prep. So I'll do like right now I'm, just, I'm doing twice a day. So I do fasted cardio. It's only 30 minutes. So I do that six days a week. Sunday is my day off. But when I go into prep, it's seven days. And that time gets longer. After this, this show, I'll probably have a meal. And then I'll hit the gym for t- uh, two, two and a half hours still doing legs. And then, then I'll be done my workout. So it's cardio in the morning. And then it's my weight training in the afternoon. How do you have time for a job, a life, a family, anything else? <laughs> It's hard to balance. When I'm in prep, there's no balance. There's no, there's no such thing as balance. And the people around me know that, you know, it, because this is so all encompassing to be really good. If you, if you just want to do a show, there's categories where you can do something called novice and novice means you're not necessarily going there to get first or second, third place. It's to say, it's kind of like, here's my transformation. This is what I looked before. And this is like what I look like after. And I think those are great to, you know, encourage people to go on this kind of journey and to show off their, their, you know, their, their bodies to be able to say, Hey, this is what I, uh, this is what I achieved. And maybe you can too, if you want, if you want, but when it comes, to, sorry, what was your question, Brian? Remind me, I went off on the tangent. How do you have time for anything else? Oh, balance. Okay. Right now. Also, I don't, I'll say <laughs> being in off season, I have more time to dedicate to the business to try to get it to grow because marketing is a big piece, as you know. So thank you for allowing me to be on your show as well. Yep. Um, my YouTube channel, I'm doing a show on RX Muscle called Iron Therapy with Dave Palumbo. So it's trying to get the word out there. So other things do go to the side for periods of time, but I do, I do have two teenagers and I do check in with them. Now, they're also at an age where they want to be with their friends more than their mother. And I, and I understand that. But so it, it's kind of being able to say, I do check in. They you don't have, need you, you have two. You have two teenagers. Do you have a husband? I did. I'm now divorced. So this is, the, this is the, another piece about competing. Now, there were issues between my husband and I well before I started competing. The competition piece, because it took me away from... Um, spending time with them because when I, when they do family trips, I can't go with them because there's a lot of times when they go, they go uh, camping and let's say in an, an RV. So we call it glamping, glamour camping. So a lot of times I can't join them on their trips because when they go, wherever they go, there's not a gym. Now I can bring, I have a TRX. I can bring some dumbbells. I can bring a BOSU ball. I have a Jacob's ladder, so I can bring some stuff. But when you're competing for a show, you need machines, you need heavier dumbbells. So that wasn't going to be in a line for what I was going what to did, do. What did he think of your transfer- transformation? He thought it was very impressive. It's just that he he was missing having a partner. And the other thing is, is that and now he's not an alcoholic by any stretch, but he likes to have a glass of wine. Wine is not on my menu. So it's kind of like, you know, there were things about the bodybuilding lifestyle that wasn't in line with, let's say, what a regular person would want. Right. So, so there's it worth nothing it? wrong with that, but it's just, it's, it's something to be aware of. And like I said, there were some other issues, but we have a very amicable relationship. So, so is, I'm really the, uh, is the bodybuilding worth it then? For me, yeah. For me, yeah. Because if, you know, there was a point where I was going to give it up. But it had gone too far and he, he wasn't able, we were going to do, I was going to do the one more show and he couldn't wait any longer. So I think he had actually checked out long before that. Right. But, you know, it, for me, it was worth it because it gives me more than that, than my marriage ever did. And that, that's really key. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Bodybuilding gives you yes. more than your marriage ever did. 
Yeah. Why? Yeah. The emotional support is something that you can't, it's very hard to put your finger on. And I didn't have that in my marriage. When we're talking before bodybuilding, I'm not talking about just bodybuilding, before bodybuilding, the emotional component was not there. I get so much more emotional support since I started bodybuilding. So for me, it made it worth it. it You were telling okay. me about um, the relationship and that it's that bodybuilding was worth it um, and that you got more emotional support from bodybuilding than you did from your marriage. Tell me a bit more. Yeah. So now I do want to, before I continue, Brian, I want to make it really clear for other people who are in similar situations, that may not be the case. So if you're doing bodybuilding and your partner isn't supportive of it, you have to really think, are you willing to walk away from this relationship for the sake of bodybuilding? And like I said, for me, there were a lot of issues before that I think would have happened that even if I was never in bodybuilding, it, may, it wouldn't have worked out. At some point, I think that for me, the bodybuilding just accelerated the process at what point that, you know, we would have separated ways. We had, you, we had very you, different interests too. Do you date? I, you know, I don't really have time to date right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering what the, what the guys, they must be unbelievably intimidated by you. Well, um, I, I, yeah, I can hold my own in a gym with 300 pound bodybuilders. They don't, they don't scare me at all. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if they, I don't know if I intimidate them. I try not to be intimidating. I'm only five feet tall, Brian, <laughs> but you know, as far as, you know, I, I try imagine to imagine some guy that's not a bodybuilding expert uh, taking his clothes off <laughs> your <laughs> presence. Oh, my God. Well, keep in mind, any pictures that you might see on my social media feed, those are when I'm in 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 prep and those are when I'm in show show shape. Basically, when I'm in my off season, like right now, I'm like 10, anywhere between 10 and 15 pounds over that. That's normal. In order for me to put on more lean muscle mass, I have to have some more calories in me. That's normal, but they have to be good calories. So that's why I also have a coach to be accountable and keep me on track so I don't go off because I still like my food. I still like my chocolate. <laughs> so it's about saying, how do I incorporate that responsibly and not go too over the board? If people want to um, access your coaching, um, how do they do that? Have you got a website? I do. So whether it be timbo.ca, so T-I-M-B-O-L.ca, or you know what, it's probably easiest if you want. I mean, you can check me out there from the registered psychotherapy for the, from the coaching. I'd say follow me on YouTube. So when you go to YouTube, just put my name, Leslie Timble, in there. And also follow me on RX Muscles um, Iron Therapy. So you'll see me actually in action with people. Because um, I just did an interview with uh, Dave Palumbo. We interviewed um, Xavier Wills. He does desktop bodybuilding. And he was talking about depression and looking for the meaning of life. So we touched upon that. And then in my episode that I posted on YouTube, I think it was just yesterday, I went on to talking about that a little bit more in detail. So, you know, I'm also open to people, you know, if they want some personal information, you know, to help themselves, shoot me a text or reach me on Instagram. So my, my, my number, if you want to text me is 416-805-6155. My Instagram handle, if you want me to send me a message there or follow me there, is Leslie T underscore mental underscore iron. And, and this would be what for people that are interested in potentially getting into bodybuilding or people that need some athletic coaching or psychotherapy. It's all of the above. I do it all. And this is why it's so important that I, I'm, I have, it's almost like, and I don't mean to come across arrogant because I'm not, but it's a triple threat. I've got the mental personal piece. I've got the mental athlete piece and I've been through stuff in my life and I've been, I'm an athlete. So I get it. It's kind of like if when, when, an, when an athlete comes to me and they're reporting certain kinds of things, let's say um, they get their blood work done. You don't go to a normal family doctor to check your blood work and see if that's okay. You go to a sports doctor. You got to go someone who's a specialist. So in that respect, I'm a specialist in those areas 
like I said, I get it because I'm in the field. We're chatting tonight with uh, Leslie Timball. She is a registered psychotherapist. She's been in private practice for 20 years. She's also a certified mental game coaching professional for athletes and her hobby. It's an extensive and expensive hobby is that of being a competitive women's physique bodybuilding. We're going to uh, take a break for some messages and come back more with Leslie in just a minute. I'm going to ask her a little bit about her, uh, her, her psychotherapist uh, business and then also about age because she believes that age is just a number, which is kind of inspiring to me. We're going to take a break. Back in two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Of course. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Leslie Timball. She is a registered psychotherapist. Uh, she's been in private practice for over 20 years. She's a certified mental game coaching professional for athletes. And we've been talking a little bit about that, about how critically important it is to have that right mental attitude if you're going to be a, an athlete. And uh, we've also talked about her, uh, her experience in the last 10 years as being a competitive women's physique bodybuilder. And, uh, and we've seen uh, some unbelievable pictures of her uh, um, working out and then also competing. Um, and it's pretty impressive. Oh, I wonder, Leslie, for a second, we could talk about your psychotherapy business. Um, so a psychotherapist is different than a psychiatrist or a sociologist or other things like that. Tell me what you do as a registered psychotherapist. So I focus mostly on with adults and I work with uh, individuals as well as couples. So if anything, I see probably more couples than I do individuals. I'm very fascinated with helping people in their relationships. I know what goes into making a successful relationship, which is probably why I'm not dating right now because I can't give people the time because I know that's that's it's a fair you know expectation. So when things settle down, I will look at relook at dating. But for now, I want to help couples, but I also help individuals deal with things such as depression, anxiety loss of a loved one and the loved one doesn't have to be a person i've spoken to a lot of people who have lost let's say pets a dog a cat a gerbil like it, it it's really encompassing as far as the things that people struggle with and they have a hard time overcoming oh yeah in-laws that's another one or outlaws as some people call them so i mean it's family relationships there's a lot of dynamics that happen that affect people's ability to have a positive outlook on life or be able to function from a day-to-day -day standpoint. How do you do that? You just chat with them or do you do any specific activities? So I, I chat with them initially because I want to hear the background. I want to know what got them to the point where they said, okay, we need to talk to somebody. So I get usually the history, the sequence of events. Now, if, especially if when it comes to a couple, I'll want to hear from each one of them because they may have different stories. And then I go into, let's set goals. What are some goals? Let's look at how realistic those goals are. And then it give them strategies. The, the particular approach I tend to use with people is cognitive behavioral. I will use some other therapies as needed, but that's primarily the, the model that I use. Cognitive behavioral, all that means is how we think and how we feel are very much intertwined. So if I said to you, you have in your hand, Brian, the winning lottery ticket. What's the feeling that would come to your mind right now? Pretty spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I said to you, you'd have people coming out of the woodwork, calling you, showing up at your door. And we're not, we're talking about some insincere, potentially manipulative people constantly on you wherever you go, because all of a sudden, you've got this winning lottery ticket or basically, you know, you have this money if you've collected. How would that make you feel? Um, it's sort of, it's what's to be expected and I've got to deal with those people anyway. It's not pleasant, but if they're hounding you, see how the feeling can change though from a really happy to like, oh, For this sure. is painful. No question. Yep. And again, it's the situation is the same. It's the winning lottery ticket, but you're feeling around it changed and I help people take the situation, we call it reframing. So we take something that's happened in their life. We can't change it. We can't go back in time. We don't have a time machine to go back in time and do something different. What we can do is to say, okay, how do we change the perspective? So instead of saying, let's say if I'm a victim or this happened to me to say, what can I benefit from this? 
So I use the expression, how do you take lemons? Let's take COVID. COVID is a big lemon. Take, let's take COVID, which is the lemon, and how do we make lemonade out of it? I'm not saying COVID was good. I'm saying if we had to go through COVID and we're still going through it, what benefits can we learn from that? And one great example is to saying, you know, we need face-to-face -face contact with people. We need we to do. be social creatures. I'm not saying we can't have our own time, but we definitely need to be able to interact with other people. That's really, really important, as well as being able to have the social supports in the variety in our lives to get beyond our house. You can live in the nicest house in the world, but anyone who is trapped at home realizes or probably felt a little bit of stir crazy to try to get out. No question. So let's um, talk a little bit about your psychotherapy business and your and your uh, dealing with uh, relationships and couples and uh, and and do you think just talking can actually solve problems like that? Talking is the first step. Doing is the other piece, and that's I give something called homework. So what that means is that if I coach a couple on how to fight fair. When I went to school, and I went to many schools, <laughs> I graduated from many schools, Brian. How many schools do you know teach you how to fight fair? None. Where do we learn how to fight? School. School, watching our parents, um, on the bus, <laughs> in the schoolyard. Those aren't necessarily the best techniques on learning how to What do you mean about this homework? What homework do you give people? So if one of the strategies I help couples with is learning how to fight fair, what I do is kind of coach them that when you disagree on something, another, I want to educate them on another way of approaching that, that same point, because we take things personally. When someone doesn't list, like when someone, if we, if we have someone and let's say you and I are in a conversation, Right, and you say uh, say something to me. Now, I might disagree with you, but I might take what you say personally, and then I wanna lash out. That's not gonna help the situation. So I wanna coach people how to use a bit more of their points from a logic standpoint versus a feeling point. So one of the things I'll say to them is, show your partner you knew what they just said, prove it. Because you saying, yeah, I heard what you said. And then they go on to their own point. I'm like, no, prove it. Summarize what they said. So, okay, Brian, you said A, B, and C. Do I understand that correctly? And Brian, you might be saying, well, it was A, B, but it wasn't C, it was actually D. Right. Okay. All right, so it was A, B, and D. Okay, now I get it. Okay, so now your partner is hearing, I, at least they heard you. So no matter if, you know, if you say the opposite thing, at least they feel being heard. A lot of couples, Will, will complain to me and say, my partner has no idea what I'm saying, what I'm saying. They don't hear me. No, physically, maybe they are hearing them, but they're not letting their partner know that. So I think, you know, basically acknowledging is a big piece in communication that you've heard the other person. I think we all need to listen better. There's just no question. We're going to take a break and come back with concluding comments with uh, Leslie in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. We're back on the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Second and Sixty. We're chatting tonight with Leslie Timble. She is a registered psychotherapist. She's been in private practice for over 20 years. In addition, she is now a certified mental game coaching professional for athletes. Uh, and she's also a bodybuilder. Um, and she's a competitor in women's physique bodybuilding. Um, a fascinating conversation. Uh, I think your psychotherapy business is interesting and your, your advice uh, and, uh, and coaching of athletes is fascinating and your bodybuilding is absolutely amazing um, and uh, really obviously is something that you, you love and you've been willing to give up a lot to, to do it. But you say that age is just a number uh, and that you can start bodybuilding in your, in your 40s and, and be bodybuilding in your mid-50s. Tell me why is age just a number? We get so caught up, you know, and this is not just women, but a lot of times women won't share their age. I actually make a point of sharing my age because I want people to break down that barrier that just because you're a certain age in your 50s, 
we associate being a certain age as being old. Well, I met 30 year olds that were old because they can't get their butts off the couch. They don't have any motivation to have a hold down a job. To me, it's trying to saying, okay, what is the definition of youth? A lot of times people will associate it with how we look. And that is one definition. But for me, I'm in better shape and I have more energy than I did when I was 25 or 30 years old. When you're competing, are you competing against people in your own age category or, or, or what? <laughs> okay, so I do both. I do my age category. Mind you, my age category is 50 and up, but I compete with 40 year olds. Um, I also compete with anyone younger than me too. It could be any age. Now, usually you don't get people who are younger than 20 in my category. So anywhere from 20 up, I'm competing against. How do you change that attitude about age not being more, more than a number? <laughs> it's hard to break down our, our identity. A lot of times we associate that um, the age with certain constructs. It's about learning how to say, okay, maybe, okay, let's say 50. A lot of times people consider 50 old. Usually it's the younger generation, but even people, they think, okay, I'm old. I'm in my fifties. Okay. Why don't you be that statistics that, that beats that, that kind of mindset. Why can't you be, why don't you be one of the forerunners to say, okay, I might be 50 biologically, but how can I be different than somebody else? Sometimes we want to be normal. So Brian, I want to encourage people not to be normal not be normal and get out there and exercise. Uh, you, you talk about that you can make any type of improvement, but it requires that you get out of your comfort zone. Is that what you mean by not being normal? Yes. A lot of times we say when our, and I'll call it your, your normal, your safety zones, your comfort zones, what we've always done, we're creatures of habit. So there's an expression to get where you've never been. You've got to go where you've never been. So it's kind of the pushing yourself outside that comfort zone so I can push myself, Brian, but I still need the accountability. So whether they, for me, the accountability is my coach, but it could be, you know, a coach, it could be a therapist. It could be a fellow competitor that you compete with in a, and you have a friendly, obviously, um, relationship with, but it's having someone accountable to, to push you to that next level. Cause left to our own devices, we go back into our comfort zones and we make excuses. You also comment about that. We all fail and that resilience is critical. Tell me a bit about that. As human beings, we're not perfect. We all make mistakes. The difference between, let's say, um, a person who falls down. So when I say fall down, I don't mean necessarily physically, but let's say they tried something and it did not work. It's really important to be able to say, okay, what can I learn from that experience? If it did not work, what can I do next time to correct that mistake or prevent that mistake from happening again? And you fine tune it. So it's about not giving up. So that's where the resiliency comes in is that despite life not going the way you want, you keep plowing forward because at some point you will be able to get through. It might take several tries. It may take multiple tries. I've been trying to get my pro card since 2014. Hopefully I'll get it at the end of this year. But you know what? If I don't, I keep trying. Right. Last question. You say that uh, um, that strength, true strength, is both mm -hmm. inner and outer. What do you mean by that? So it's important to have some type of physical strength. You know, not, and again, this is not just women, but women are prone to osteoporosis. But as, especially as we age, it's important to have a certain amount of strength so we can function in life and to protect our bones, our joints, that kind of thing. So we can live longer lives. One day, my kids, and I don't want to rub the, I don't want to rush this by any stretch. One day they'll get married and one day they might have kids. I want to keep up with my grandkids one day. So, you know, that kind of physical strength from, but also a mental strength is important too. Mental strength takes a lot of courage because it's easy to give up. It's easy to take the easy road and, you know, sit, watch TV and eat bonbons. I mean, who, who, you know, a lot of us can, you can do that. It's not the healthiest thing. And once in a while, it's not a bad thing. But the mental fortitude to be able to say, no matter what life throws at me, it might slow me down, but it's not going to stop me. I'm going to keep coming back. Now, let's say we're talking about an injury. I'll pick on bodybuilding or actually any sport. 
you get injured, you might have to retire earlier than what you wanted. If you have the mental fortitude, and this is also where the mental game coaching comes in, I help people redefine what their next path in life would be. So mental fortitude does not mean keep going until you win. It means you do your best to the utmost of your ability. And if you need to, what I call pivot, change the direction, but keep going forward. That's what mental fortitude is. It's going forward. Again, it might require some pivoting, but it's constant improvement. And that's what I mean by the mental strength. We've been chatting tonight about uh, bodybuilding, about uh, psychotherapy, about inner strength and outer strength, um, about um, mental fortitude uh, when one's an athlete or when's just uh, a regular person with Leslie Timball. Uh, and it's been a really fascinating conversation. Um, remind us the website or the Instagram that they can go to if they want to follow you. So follow me on Instagram. It's Leslie T underscore mental underscore iron. You can also find me on RX Muscles Iron Therapy, as well as I have a YouTube channel. If you just put Leslie Timble in there, I have two episodes up and I'll be working on that a little bit more. And if you guys want some other kinds of uh, content on my website or to be discussed on in the, in the podcast, feel free to reach out or put a comment in one of my, my posts uh, or even in this post as well. Brian, I want to really thank you for this opportunity. It was really great. My and pleasure thank you. meeting you. Thank you so much for sharing an hour with us. Thank you. Well, that's our show for tonight, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Leslie. Good night.